Can I get two? Oh, and guac. At Amplify, we've eliminated all banking fees, so you can enjoy more of life's extras. No fees equals more guac. Amplify. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live virtual conversation today with Constance Wu and her new book, Making a Scene. I'm Lois Kim, Executive Director of the Texas Book Festival. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad we were able to reschedule this event, which we planned in conjunction with Jen Padalecki as Jen's October book club pick. I imagine that there are some Texas Book Festival friends in our audience today. If you're not familiar with us, the Texas Book Festival is a nonprofit whose mission is to connect authors and readers through memorable and impactful experiences. Experiences like our in-person annual festival, which we just wrapped up in downtown Austin, where we hosted more than 300 authors of all ages and genres, an event that we were able to provide for free thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Today's event is also free, and I want to thank Amplify Credit Union for sponsoring and serving as a major festival sponsor this year. If you have end-of-year donations planned for your favorite charitable organizations, I hope you'll consider adding TBF to your list. We'll have a donation link posted in our chat today. Now, on to our program. We are so excited to host Constance Wu today. Constance Wu is the Golden Globe Award-nominated star of Crazy Rich Asians and Hustlers. Her breakthrough role was starring as Jessica Huang, in the television comedy, Fresh Off the Boat. She's been nominated for the Screen Actors Guild Award, two Television Critics Association Awards, and four Critics' Choice Awards. Time has honored her as one of the 100 most influential people of the year. In conversation with Constance today is Kara Watson, executive editor at Scribner Books. Welcome to all, and I hope you enjoyed the program. I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have questions for Constance, um, please put them in the Q&A and um, we'll start taking your questions around 1230. But um, in the meantime, I'm so excited to see Constance. Um, so Making a Scene has been out for a little while now and the reviews have been pretty incredible. So just last week, the New York Times book review called it dazzling. And they said that your depth of emotion makes the memoir both captivating and tender and also that it's bursting with revelation and reckoning. Um, have you heard anything from readers that's really resonated with you? Um, first of all, I want to say apologies in advance. I might be blowing my nose a lot during this because I'm still like in the dregs of getting over the flu. But um, you know what's been really surprising and kind of sad to me that I've heard from a lot of people is you know, the producer I talk about in my book, M, his first initial is M, um, who harassed me and intimidated me. Uh, this is pre Me Too movement. I've heard from a lot of other Asian American women who um, he's done that too. And um, that's pretty sad. And, and then, uh, but then, you know, the thing that's been really lovely to me is people responding to a lot of the very I guess relatable stuff in there. I mean, I know the media has focused a lot on the more dramatic elements like the tweets and the suicide attempt and the sexual harassment, but that was never really, I mean, you even know, I, that, that, that was the last essay I wrote and only after you urged me to, I didn't even <laughs> want to include it in the book. I wanted it to be more just about the kind of fiction I liked reading, which is like, you know, my favorite book as a kid was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Yeah. Felt like a kid, a normal kid going through like a normal kid feelings. And so people responding a lot to the chapters about like my my relationship with my little sister or my relationship with other lovers or uh, my relationships with my next door neighbors, things that are very almost pedestrian, but that's what makes them kind of beautiful. Yeah, that yeah. was kind of the experience I wanted for my readers, which is not what you expect from a quote unquote celebrity memoir. Right. So I think if you go into it looking for that, it's kind of like, oh, this is not what I expected. But the people who really have enjoyed the more relatable elements has been um, very heartening to hear for me. 
Well, that's what drew me in initially is you just write really beautifully about experiences that a lot of us have had our, you know, first love, first jobs, how our family dynamics work. So um, I, I think it definitely is not a traditional celebrity memoir in any way. And you were saying um, earlier, like how much that annoys you when people call it that, like what bothers you about the word memoir? Well, because I think a memoir <clears throat> is like a complete story um, told sort of in chronological order. Mm -hmm. And I wanted these, um, each essay to be sort of a slice of life, but like from various different pies that aren't supposed to go together. So um, they have, they all have an overarching theme, but that's because I am the, I guess, narrator of all of them. And I have overarching themes in my own life, but it's not a narrative of like how I became who I am or anything like that. It's just little slices of my life. What it was like working in a bakery, what it was like playing Cassandra in the Orisaya, like just little things that don't necessarily, that aren't meant to connect, that aren't meant to be chronological. They're just little slices of life. And so um, I do, one thing I have heard from a lot of people is like, oh, it jumps around in time a lot. And I'm like, well, I mean, so does like one of my favorite books, Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay, which is not considered a memoir, but it is personal. It's extremely personal. And it's, um, but then she has, you know, essays in that, that are about like Scrabble tournaments, do you know? And then, but then also like, also about sexual assault. It's not meant to be a memoir, but I think because I'm an actor, it is often labeled as such. Mm -hmm. And I think it annoys me because I, I don't like disappointing people who want to read like, a beginning, middle, and end type of story. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm like, to be honest, for the most part, I think you could jump in to any essay and you don't need the context of the previous ones um, because they're just little slices of life. Um, I love that. And that's also how like our memory works too, right? Like you're not just like, I'm going to go back and think of my childhood through college, through every, you know, like you might one day think about the summer you were at the monastery or the summer you were a kid just reading books and eating popsicles, you know? It I'm is. Like, you know what? I do think sometimes when we go to like a movie, for example, we want one story. Um, and I just think this is many stories. And it, it is, is how we remember it. But, you know, if you go into it thinking it's going to be just one story, um, you know, a, an essay about my cars has nothing to do with an essay about <laughs> my experience living on a Buddhist monastery. It really kind of doesn't. Um, so, so yeah, that's why I'm like, it's not really a memoir. It's like, it's like, you know, like Bad Feminist is a book of essays. Not, it's not Roxanne Gay's memoir. It's a book of essays, personal essays. Sure. Um, you mentioned the producer. So one thing that's been frustrating to me is how the media really focused on that particular story, um, which, you know, I think it represents less than one eighteenth of the book. There are 18 essays here. And that one is about more than him. Um, so as you're saying, there are a lot of really like joyful moments in this and a lot of love and light. Um, what what was your favorite piece to write? To write? <laughs> or um, like, I mean, someone favorite as in most enjoyable or most meaningful, or like hmm. the most enjoyable essay for me to write was probably either Montana Gold or Betty and Sid, the one about my next door neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, probably Betty and Sid, just because I, I miss them so much. And they were like my surrogate grandparents. And like, I have nothing but fondness for them. And anything quote unquote bad that happens in the essay, which really nothing does, just typical teenage stuff is typical teenage stuff trying to figure out who you are when you've left the suburbs and gone to the big city and like your big city boyfriend is judging your like small town next door neighbors and like how to like reckon with that um i love i love that piece and I, I i i think it's a very representative of me how i grew up and how i process and um how i go through change so I, yeah that's probably my favorite one <laughs> I love that piece too. And there's something sort of pure and uncomplicated about that relationship that we, you know, with our family and our exes or whatever, there there's, there's more to unpack probably. Yeah. Um, 
So speaking of how you grew up, you grew up in Virginia, one of four <laughs> girls, your parents came here from Taiwan. Um, and you talked about being raised not to make a scene. So uh, just talked a little bit about that. And, or, and are you raising your daughter? I'm sure the answer is yes, but differently. I think that this is where there's been a little discrepancy. I don't think it's my family per se that raised me not to make a scene, but I do think it's it was my environment growing up in the South, but also kind of in America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the way we teach girls to be sweet. I mean, I literally remember people in school, teachers saying little girls should be seen and not heard. Like that was a, that was like, you know, an idiom, you know? And this is like 30 years ago. I mean, it's not like a hundred years ago. I mean, it might still be today in some places. It is still today, less so in the cities, but it is, it is still today. There are still gender expectations. Um, and this is not for me to knock those gender expectations. Cause here's the thing people are like, oh, are you going to raise your daughter to make a scene? And I'm like, if that's her natural way of being, I don't think just like my parents were very hands off. They weren't tiger parents. They just sort of let me do whatever the fuck I wanted to do, whether it was make a scene or not. They just were like, okay, she's just <laughs> do what she's going to do. And I feel like you can't wrangle like control who your kid's going to become. And if you do try to do that, they're probably going to be pretty unhappy. And I think the most enjoyable way to go about it, or at least in my experience with parenting, is just to get to witness who they become and to support that. So some people think like, I'm telling people to make a scene and going out there and be loud and be activists. I'm like, no, only if that's your natural inclination. Like my, my essay about my little sister, a snap and whistle, I would never ask somebody like my sister to go out and make a scene over like, some feminist issue because she's just a natural introvert. She's always been that way since childhood. And there's, I'm not knocking that. Um, I do knock the Asian American male activists who are very vocal naturally, but then have become very, very shut up and quiet on the subject of uh, inter-Asian misogyny and sexism and patriarchy within Asian American culture. That's telling. But if you're naturally already an introverted person, what an interesting, wonderful thing to watch. The way you express, the way you socialize, the way you move through the world. So I'm really just enjoying watching my daughter become herself and letting her know that she is great as she is. So if she's loud and rowdy, great. If she's quiet and soft-spoken, great too. You are like my one of my favorite self-help writers, Brene Brown, worthy now. You are worthy as you are. You know, not when you become more polite, not when you become more outspoken, not when you lose 10 pounds as you are. And I think that's um, for me growing up, it was stifling because I was a naturally a very emotional, extroverted person. Um, but for my little sister, it wasn't because she's she is naturally more soft spoken and introverted. And that's OK, too. We want to make sure not to pass judgment on different types of people when we're promoting, you know, the expression of our own kind of person, you know? Sure. Um, I'm just going to quickly mention that um, there is a link to buy the book <laughs> through Book People, um, a great independent local bookstore for you all in Austin. And um, I, we hope you will buy it. And there is a lot to enjoy and unpack. And we'll just keep discussing some of those things. So you're yeah. saying... Um, you kind of were encouraged to have these big emotions and find your voice through community theater. And I think it's really cool that you're doing a play now. Like, how does it feel to be on, on stage again? It's awesome. It's so, it's not even just being on stage. I mean, yes, I feel very comfortable on stage, truly. Like I could, oh, so I could fart on stage and not be embarrassed. That's how <laughs> comfortable I am, seriously. Like, um, but it's really the community. I mean, I talk about community theater. It's the language, the shorthand that theater people have with each other, the way they talk about character and dialogue and scene work and inner monologues, the way that they connect and light up theater people. It's very different from film and TV people. Not I'm not knocking film and TV people, but it film and TV is. There's so many more elements 
you know, there's camera, there's lighting, there's sound. With theater, it's really human emotions and text. Yes, we have tech week, which is like when they figure out all the lighting and the sound cues. But once that's done, that's just one week. Then it's just the human interactions and the language. And I'm a language girl. I love language. So um, it's been awesome just automatically falling in with like my cast members who are great and like the crew, they're theater people. And there is that shorthand and there is just that sense of community wherever you go. You know, even if you go to France and you meet theater people, like it's just, um, I, I felt the same way when I was a runner, you know, when I ran marathons. It's like when you see another runner who's also like training for a marathon and they have their goo or whatever, like you're like, <laughs> I know you, I get, you know, like they got their Brooks shoes, they got their goo, they got like all their like gear, you know, they call it a bladder, their camel pack. You're like, we, we know each other. We know each other's culture and, um, and it's kind of universal. And I love that about theater and it is where I feel most at home and safest and um, gosh, I, I, I just, I love it anyway. We only have three more days left. So if anybody's in LA, come see our play. It's called 222. Go see it. I mean, can we see it? Is it like filmed at all? Like, can I watch a recording? No. But that's the thing that's great about it, right? Yeah, right. That's why I think I, you know, I had this theory recently. I was like, you know, there are a lot of like movie actors that are very like self-important when it comes to like a method. And it's almost like kind of annoying because it becomes more about ego than what method really is. Um, but I think the reason for that is because in film, everything is, it has the illusion of finality. This performance is going to be preserved on film forever, whatever take they use. Whereas theater, you do it eight shows a week. There are going to be, it's alive. There are going to be days where you're connected to certain parts and where you're not connected to other parts. And so you can't be precious about it. You can't be egotistical about like, oh, this has to be the pinnacle of everything. No, this has to be what it is today. What's living in the atmosphere, what I'm breathing in my lungs today, what's happening in my body today is alive and it's there and it's going to be different the next night. And so it's sort of hard to have an ego when you're doing theater because it's not memorialized. It's mm. every day. It's a different show and it's live and the audience is alive and like you feed off the energy. So um, this is me theater geeking out, but truly <laughs> it's been like, it's been, I used to only do theater and it's been like 10 years since I've done a play. So to be back in it, it's like, fuck yeah. Oh, can I say fuck? I don't know. It's like, yes, I'm back anyway. And that's a lot of what my book is about too. It's about being um, a theater person and how art is very healing for, um, was healing for me, continues to be healing for me. That's what I was just thinking that somehow um, the experience of reading is like whatever the reader brings to it. You know, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know quite the connection. Wow, like, but if yeah. Never read, like if you read Catcher in the Rye when you're 16 versus when you're like 40, it's different. <laughs> I haven't tried at 40. Should I go back to it? Uh, I, mean, I loved it so much at 16. I think, I think it's at 16, you fall into the traps of it a little bit more. Mm. And I think when you're older, you kind of, it's kind of funnier. And I think um, it's a little more tragic, but not in such a romantic way. I think teenagers romanticize Holden Caulfield in a way it's like, oh no, this kid was mentally ill, <laughs> you know? But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the language stays the same, but you evolve and how cool is that, you know? Very cool. Um, a lot of people have talked about your raw honesty and something that I really admire is that you don't always necessarily make yourself look perfect, um, in these stories. Was that important to you? Was that a goal of yours in the writing? Oh, I mean, it's the only way I know how to be. I'm so, so sick. Well, I mean, it's not that it's not the only way I know how to be, but it's like, a lot of people have been like, oh, you're so brave for that. I'm like, honey, I ain't brave. I'm just tired. <laughs> Truly, it's fatigue of putting up this like perfect image. And even the imperfect parts that you put up are put up, be like, oh, look at me. I'm being so vulnerable. When I think um, the places where we really connect um, to people are sort of the uglier parts. Um, I guess that's why people call it brave because a lot of people aren't willing to show it. I call it just me being tired because I'm like, I don't, and I'm also sick of the like celebrity memoir. That's like, 
oh, I'm a humble person who came from this and overcame the odds, or, oh, I had to go through all this difficult trauma to, to become this person. I just don't think that's the whole story. And it's not to say that I think I'm a bad person or they're hiding, you know, those memoirists are hiding their bad traits. It's just, it just doesn't feel whole if I'm just promoting myself as innocent or hero or victim or um, girl next door who me. I'm all of those things. I can be all of things. And we all can be all of those things, right? So it was important to me to just be honest about that so that it's a whole picture. Because when you see me on a press tour for like Crazy Rich Asians or Fresh Off the Boat, you know, obviously it's going to be a slightly filtered side of me, not because they're repressing me or anything, but because I have to match myself to the content, you know, like if I'm doing a family show, I'm not going to, you know, be talking about blowjobs. Like it's just, it's inappropriate. It's not me stifling myself. It's just inappropriate. Um, so I think with the book, it was my opportunity to be authentically myself without having to filter out certain aspects of myself in order to fit the promotional material for a groundbreaking film or a feminist film or things like this is like no this is and and i don't think i make myself out to be like super tragic or super heroic either i think i think that's what's disappointing about my book i think my story is pretty ordinary um but again like i said at the beginning that's that's the kind of fiction i really like um i mean i don't think it's disappointing and i think it's there's something extraordinary in the ordinary um that you capture really well um have you i know that you loved to write as um as a kid and your writing was so good that your teacher accused you of plagiarizing um <laughs> that good actually <laughs> that paper she accused me of that wasn't even that good it was actually bad it was it wasn't about me being good it's about her not believing i had ability I, it wasn't that good. I remember it was so dramatic and horrible. If I wrote that today, I'd be like, what? What does this kid think she's doing? But yeah, she did accuse me of plagiarism. When did you like start writing the pieces that became this book? 2016. At first, I thought it was going to be like a super political book because, you know, that was like around the time of the election and like. Mm -hmm tensions were high and emotions were high and mine included and I didn't really know where to put it or how to wrangle it so I thought I would write this feminist tome and I tried and then I'd think that I was so great because that was an ego driven thing right and then I'd read it the next day and be like oh this is crap this is so awful it's all over the place it's arrogant it doesn't know what it's saying um but then every once in a while there'd be like a little snippet of a personal story in one of my political essays and I'm like oh that's the story mm -hmm. that's something I that's what I want to read that's what I want to write about and so I'd expand upon that and so it evolved into what it wanted to be rather than what my ego wanted it to be um I think if my ego had written it it would be oh I'm this heroic immigrant story or I'm you know all, all of these kind of you know feel good kind of things or it would have become super political and badass, but it's not because it evolved into what it wanted to be. Kind of like, like I was saying with my daughter, she's going to evolve into what she wants to be. And the best thing I could do is not try to wrangle her into any type of political tone or like whatever, you know, she's going to be, and how fun to get to witness that and to get to enjoy that. Um, so it, it took a long time because I wrote it all myself. Um, and which is super impressive, by the way, like I tell people that and they're like, she did. I'm like, of course she did. Of yeah. I didn't realize did. how right. rare that is for actors to do. Yeah. But of course, you know, if it is about ego actors don't want to talk about their ghostwriters either, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. they're very hands-on editors. Um, but yeah, no, I wrote that all by my, but that's why it took me so long. You know? <laughs> it took me so long. Do you miss though, like that writing, the exercise of writing? Do you find yourself 
wanting to write more. Exercise is a really good word because it is kind of like that in that sometimes when you exercise, you like, they're like dragging your feet. You really don't want to do it. But then like when you're in the middle of it, it's, everything runs better, <laughs> you know, your lungs, your heart, your mind, everything is just clearer. Um, but sometimes it is like dragging your feet to get started. Um, so yeah, that's the answer. Yes, yes and no. It's enjoyable, but getting, getting on the, lace on the running shoes <laughs> is not the easiest part. Right. But one trick, if there are any writers here, that I learned that is helpful when you when I got really stuck, and I write about this in the book, when I got really stuck or frustrated with um, my writing, and I was just like, everything is just shit, everything, this is all bad, this is horrible, I, I don't know what to write, is I went back to sense memory. Um, that's an exercise that you learn when you're learning method acting, where you don't talk about the feelings or even the events of something happening, you just talk about the sensory elements of it, um, how something smelled, tasted, felt, sounded. Um, and it's sort of detached from judgment or emotion because it's just the senses, right? And when I was stuck, going back to sense memory was a really good way of helping me get out of sort of a hole. And I think, again, how I say art is healing um and me learning sense memory exercises in acting school has been very helpful it reminds me of this quote i read once from hemingway where he was like talking about like don't write about the emotion of catching the fish write about the way the line glistened in the sun when it tightened write about how it felt to grab that pole and to be tugged for that sense memory. That's Ernest Hemingway talking about sense memory, but just like in a totally different way. And so for me, like applying it with like my acting training was really cool. And I think would be really helpful for anybody. I mean, I think you do it so well and it leads to really gorgeous descriptive prose and um, of how things looked and tasted and smelled and, and felt I think you do really well oh um there we're gonna shift to the Q&A portion um let's hey, see I, love I know first okay. question hearing about your writing process I'm curious if writing this book has reignited your passion for writing <laughs> it's reignited my passion for reading although I've always had that but like I'm on and off like I'll go through like an entire year where I only read three books <laughs> and then I'll go through like a month where I read 10, you know, it just, um, but I definitely, um, it's reignited my love for reading. And has it changed anything about the way you read now that you know what it's like to publish a book? Yeah, it's changed a lot. It's made me appreciate um, <laughs> restraint in writing. Mm -hmm. um, like right now, I mean, I just finished a book by Chinua Achebe. And um, yeah, it just I like it made me really appreciate how like he could just write a character's thoughts without judgment which I think so many writers have a lot, so many people on the internet have judgment, but just writing the thoughts wasn't like, a, like at the end, the white, the white guy who was the colonizer in, um, what is it? Things fall apart. You know, this, this horrible thing happens at the end. And in the end, the, the white guy is sort of like, he's thinking to himself how good this would sound in a book. And he was very pleased to get home and write it. <laughs> No, but it's like, this is a true thing. Yeah, but, sure. But, but but the writer, the author, Achebe, he's not like mocking him. This is a feeling that people genuinely have. It's like I had a friend of mine who went through a breakup and 
he was wrecked over it. But then part of it was like he was so wrecked over it that he like wasn't eating. And so like the other 10% of himself was looking in the mirror because he thought he looked better because he was like <laughs> more felt. This is not saying that he's all that, but this is a human thing. And it's so interesting when you see like behaviors like that. Like we all have those. Um, and like when the writer can really capture that really well, um, I think is, I really admire it. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. In your family, who was or is your favorite storyteller? My dad's a pretty good storyteller. Um, and then my sisters are not really storytellers. Um, oh yeah, my dad's, a, my dad's, my mom's a good storyteller too. Um, yeah, so it's my parents. Are. I think it's interesting at the end of the, the last essay, your parents have like different versions of a story. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Especially when you <laughs> send it to your parents and you're like, uh, I'm going to publish this. Is this okay? And they tell me, tell me whether or not it's okay. Um, yeah. And there are other events in this book where like even the bakery, my, my best friend, Marianne, she was like, she wasn't upset, but she was like annoyed with the bakery piece because she was like, well, you didn't talk about like, you didn't talk about how animated you were at the bakery, how you used to sing all the time. And like, you were telling jokes. And I was like, Marianne, the essay wasn't about me. She's like, yeah, but it's incomplete unless you talk about that. And I'm like, no. And she, I'm like, it's incomplete to you because that was your experience. But me singing show tunes all the time, that's my day to day, <laughs> nothing extraordinary. But to her, it was like, it almost felt like a betrayal that I didn't talk about myself singing show tunes as I was baking. Cause it's just, it didn't, that to me is like breathing, but to her, it was so like fun and different. So, you know. It's a was, slice of your life that not, the readers don't get, but your best friend does, I guess, and your family and whoever. Well, to her, it right. would be something that was so, it was such a memorable part of working at the bakery for her because we always worked there together. To me, I don't, I mean, I don't doubt that I did that because I know that I do that, but I don't even remember being like that just because it's not, it's not extraordinary to me. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the different parts of a story, the things that you focus on, uh, is, is interesting. Okay. Next question while you blow your nose. Um, you describe reading through early drafts and applying a critical lens to it, asking questions about what was ego driven, what was working, what wasn't. Did you have other readers, um, or writing friends look at it? Nope. Just you, Kara. And you had a very light touch. Um, No, your agent read it before me, probably. He read it, but he didn't give me notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just birds amazing, but he's so nice. He's just like, oh, it's amazing. It's so great. Like, <laughs> this is the best thing I've ever read. I mean, this, this is what agents do. Not that he's just an agent, but you know, he's just like a lot of praise. No, he, he read it. Um, but you know, I didn't, yeah, like I didn't, my boyfriend didn't even read it until the galley was out. And even that I had to change some things in the galley. Um, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't. There was one person I wanted to have their opinion on because he's sort of the only person that I kind of, I don't want to say trust, but uh, he'd be the right ear for it. And mm -hmm. that's in the essay, I talk about the, the character George. Mm. He's always been that for me, um, but I don't talk to him anymore. So um, even though I did ask him for permission to, to publish that particular essay. So he did read that one. Okay. Uh, about him. I bet he's read the book. I would guess. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, if if there were one person who I would have sought editorial help on or like opinions, uh, it would have been him. Well, it's funny because like my boyfriend's like, he writes screenplays and he gets opinions from everybody. Like he sends it to everybody to get feedback. I'm very much like, I like to do it like in a vacuum. I like, um, I don't want too many cooks. I, I want to be the cook, <laughs> you know? Um, 
different people have different processes. Okay. Were there many stories you would have liked to tell, but taught for one reason or another? There's only that one, you know, I'm talking about the one about that big publishing corporation. The, the yeah. <laughs> Which I, um, I think is a great story and I think is, um, really interesting and says a lot about the publishing world and, um, not the book publishing world, but like magazine publishing and, um, but you were like, you know, I don't want it to look like you have an ax to grind and mm -hmm. I don't either. Cause that's an ego thing too. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like even when I talk about M sexually harassing me, that's not me trying to get people on my side. Cause I, I equally talk about how I understand him mm -hmm. and I equally talk about how there were times where I felt like I was complicit, you know? So that wasn't ego driven, but the, um, the one about that, the one that we cut, uh, I could see how somebody might think that was sort of like getting back at somebody. Um, so I understand that, but I, I do think it's something that a lot, a lot of people have the guts to talk about. And I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of like regret, not, not a regret it, but like, that's one I would have included. Right. But I would say generally, there's not a lot that you seem to be withholding. Um, I feel like no. you're very, very open. Yeah. The ones I cut were just like, just because they weren't that interesting. Like the ones about me working at Paramount's King's Dominion as a singer. I worked as a singer dancer at Paramount's King's Dominion. There was one about that and it was all about like learning about stage presence. It it was fine, but it just wasn't, I just didn't think it was that good. So I don't like, it doesn't hurt me that I cut that one. That one should be cut. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone wants to know what, what was the hardest essay to write and are there any you wish you'd left out? Um, the one about Fresh Off the Boat sexual harassment that was really, really hard to write because it was really hard to revisit. Um, and now being on the other side of it, you know, it's just really hard to go back to that place where like you were so scared and you didn't, or I didn't know what to do. And, um, and I was like so alone in it. I didn't have any precedent. Like I didn't have anybody who was like any other actresses who had really done what I was doing. And I didn't have friends at that level in the industry. I was so alone and scared and, um, I didn't have a cushion even in terms of like financial stability. So like it was it was a scary thing to revisit. Um you know, and the suicide attempt was scary to revisit. <sighs> but what was sadder and harder for me was remembering the <clears throat> two years of the that microaggressive abuse um that um inflicted upon me that is still kind of painful because people still aren't really giving it uh seriousness especially in the asian american community they're like oh it wasn't that bad i mean that's rape culture 101 people saying it's not that bad um but it shouldn't have happened at all and it's uh yeah that was really hard to write i don't i were if i were to regret putting that essay in it would be because it's been so much the focus when i didn't want the book that to be the focus but it's not because i wouldn't have wanted to include it so there's nothing that i regret including for my sake i might regret including some of the stuff because of how the media has sensationalized it but um, from a personal standpoint, no, there's nothing. That I, I don't regret including anything. Yeah. I'm glad. Um, if you could chat with your readers, what do you hope they come away with from reading your book? Uh, I just, uh, I would, I would love for them to come away with what I got from writing it, which is like my shoulders went from here to here. And, uh, you know, especially with today's social media age, upholding this image, um, always trying to be likable. My oldest sister was like, well, you're not always likable in the book. And I'm like, yeah, but like, isn't that life? Like, are we, are we not at the point where we could stop talking about a woman's 
likability and just like talk about her whole humanity like what does it have to do with anything but especially with actors you're still like trying to be likable in a lot of these memoirs and I think it's such I hope readers rather than worrying about being likable I, I hope that it makes them start thinking about being knowable it's better to be known for who you are than to be liked for who for half of who you are right um, it's just more freeing that way in anything, in intimate romantic relationships, in family relationships, being known as a whole person, not being liked as an idea of a person. Um, I think I think we we all would be a lot less lonely if we were able to do that. Um, I think if that was the goal that you have achieved that, um, well, that's what so many readers and reviewers are responding to. Thanks. Um, Someone says, you mentioned reading Catcher in the Rye at 16 and 40. What other books, I like this question. What other books do you think one should read repeatedly through life? And do you have any recommendations? I don't think Catcher in the Rye is one you should read repeatedly during life. I was just thinking <laughs> that, but yeah, it just came, that was the first idea that came in my head. Um, that's a great question. We're having I mean, our cough drops now. I know I've, I've gone through like six recalls because <laughs> I otherwise I'll just like <laughs> you know I I come back to another JD uh, JD Salinger book a lot which is Franny and Zooey I come back to that a lot because it's about religion and actors mm -hmm. I mean it's very much <gasps> totally up my alley and that changes a lot every mm -hmm. time I read I've read that probably like 30 40 times wow um, truly I have I I've like memorized entire sections of that um yeah, I think I really like Revisiting Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I think revisiting certain things that when you were younger, you think you're supposed to like. Like, I remember as a younger theater person, I, I was like, oh, I'm supposed to like Chekhov. I'm supposed to like Sondheim. So I'm going to pretend I like them when I don't really like them. But now that I'm older, I genuinely love them. Like, I get it now. I didn't have the life experience when I was 18 to get the beauty of a Chekhov scene. But I had the ego to want to say that I liked it. So I did. And I think revisiting certain things that you thought that you should like, but you didn't know. <laughs> um, and then sometimes you'll re read something and be like, Oh, I thought that was so good. This is crap. This is like a piece of misogynistic crap. Um, but so I think it's interesting to to revisit some of the things that um, maybe you wouldn't have understood when you were a kid, like Chekhov. Right. Or that you considered formative, but need to be reviewed. Yeah. Um, okay, last question before wrap. If you could pick only one, a Tony, a Pulitzer, or an Oscar? <laughs> What would I pick? What would you pick? None. I'm a process person, not a results person. And I truly mean that. I think, I think, uh, I hate ranking shit. I hate, I mean, like, obviously, if I were nominated for any of those, I would be grateful beyond belief. But it's not the work. It's beside the point. In fact, a lot of times people are like, oh, don't read your, like, bad reviews because it'll get you in your head or whatever. I actually think praise fucks up your performance too, because you start feeling good about yourself in an ego way. When the work, if you're a really good actor, is it's, it's outside your ego, you know? You're giving yourself to it. It's not there to support you on this pedestal. It, if I were to ever like get one of those awards, of course I would be grateful, and I would be a little bit worried mm -hmm. how it would affect my performance and even with that work because the same thing happens every time I go to a movie I do another movie I'm like oh why can't I connect to my character today what the fuck what like I was so connected yesterday and I have to learn the same lesson over and over again and I'm like oh it's because yesterday I did such a good job and I was feeling so good about myself that I'm like riding back home feeling good about how I did my work today and like feeling pat patting myself on the back and my instrument which is my soul my body shuts down when I do that. They're like, it knows. It's like, nah, -uh. 
I'm not going to let you access this shit to pump up your ego. You can access the heart if you're giving it to Jessica Huang, if you're giving it to Destiny, if you're giving it to Rachel Chu, whatever part you're playing. But if you're doing it to pump yourself up, no, closed, closed, gone, shut off. And I, even though I'm 40, I still have to learn this lesson over and over again. So even though I intellectually know that if I won one of these awards, that I would have to like watch myself for that. It would still happen because my heart is smarter than my brain. It does. It just shuts off. And you're like, what the heck, man? Um, and it does. It happens to me. So I would say um, none of them. Hey, but you know what? <laughs> you know what, though? If I got a Grammy, that would be really funny. <laughs> Because it's so not in the realm of anything. And also because my boyfriend is an indie rocker. And I'd be like, oh, I got a Grammy and you didn't. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'd choose that. i choose a Grammy. Okay. Well, I think that's a perfect answer. And um, I think we need to wrap up. So thank you so much for sharing your heart and your brain with us and putting it all into the book. And um, thank you to the Texas Book Festival. And feel better. Thank you. You too. I'll see you later. Nicola. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you Thank for joining us.